So our first speaker for the afternoon is Cameron Myers from the University of Minnesota. Um, he's studying rock and mineral physics and his advisor is David Kolstedt. He's a fourth year fellow and he did his practicum at Lawrence Livermore in 2016. And he will be telling us about an experimental view of Earth's upper mantle, densification, deformation, and recover recovery of olivine rich rocks. All right, uh, thank you. Um, it's kind of an ambitious title, but uh, I hope you guys are ready to switch gears and talk about some uh, experimental work trying to understand uh, the dynamics of our planet, uh, specifically uh, the Earth's upper mantle. Uh, so um, this here is a picture of what's called a mantle xenolith. So that's a rock that's been uh, erupted through a volcano. Uh, and in its process of eruption, it uh, took a piece of the mantle up with it. And so this uh, green, Portion here is uh, what's called uh, peridotite, and that's a rock that contains uh, a green mineral called olivine. So I'm going to be talking to you about experiments on uh, olivine-rich rocks. So uh, I'm going to start out by kind of contextualize my research for you guys um, and just give you an overview of uh, where this is all coming from. So this is just a cross-section of the Earth. Um, reminding you of what the mantle is, it's the large silicate region uh, between uh, the molten outer core and the crust where we have uh, familiar tectonic features like mid-ocean ridges and subduction zones. And those tectonic features are uh, motivated by um, flow in the Earth's mantle. And so that solid state flow uh, in the Earth's mantle might ask the question of how does uh, that occur and um, what does convection look like in the mantle? For instance, are there uh, layered convection cells or is there a whole mantle convection. So to answer that question, we need to know, well, what is the viscosity of those materials? Um, and then we might also want to know, well, what are those materials? So this is a plot showing uh, the volume fraction of uh, crystal phases in the Earth's mantle with depth. And it shows that uh, in the upper mantle, uh, about 60% of the upper mantle is olivine. That's an iron magnesium silicate. Um, and it's very important to the dynamics of the planet um, and considered by our community to control deformation in the Earth's mantle. So that's uh, motivated a large body of experimental work where people have taken olivine ceramics, uh, taken like a cylinder of olivine ceramic and deformed it in axial compression uh, to low strains, like 10% strain, and try to understand the deformation mechanisms that lead to flow in the Earth. And so uh, what people have found is that olivine flows at high temperatures and pressures by power law creep in different uh, regimes. So that's a, a strain rate is related to uh, the stress to the nth power and the grain size to the minus nth power. So stress and grain size dependence are important uh, in understanding flow in the earth. And so the different mechanisms that people tend to talk about are diffusion creep, that has a uh, linear dependence on stress and a nonlinear dependence on grain size. Dislocation creep, which is a dislocation accommodated mechanism uh, that has a nonlinear stress dependence and no grain size dependence. And dislocation accommodated grain boundary sliding, which is kind of an intermediate regime uh, that has a nonlinear stress dependence and uh, some grain size dependence as well. So people have taken these experiments, made flow laws, and tried to map out uh, in grain size and stress space at different strain rates uh, when these regimes might be important and then try to extrapolate that to the earth to understand flow. So one of the uh, important things to note is that these are low strain experiments. So these are experiments where you've taken an olivine ceramic, deformed it to uh, very low strain and so the, the, the microstructure hasn't really mo been modified by the deformation significantly. Uh, also important to note is the really important role of grain size in uh, determining what flow in the mantle might be like. And so one of the important things we might ask is, well, what controls grain size in the Earth's mantle? So uh, in crystalline materials, uh, grains grow at high temperature to try to reduce the energy of the microstructure. So there are kind of two, <laughs> two classic regimes of grain growth. One is uh, the continuous or normal grain growth regime in which the microstructure kind of coarsens uniformly. And the other is the, or the discontinuous or abnormal grain growth regime uh, 
in which uh, large grains grow at the expense of smaller grains, and you uh, result in a, a bimodal grain size. And so this might be important in uh, controlling the, the grain size in the Earth's mantle. In addition to grain growth, there's also mechanisms for grain size reduction. So uh, dynamic recrystallization is a mechanism for grain size reduction where uh, dislocations basically facilitate the, uh, the addition of more grain boundary area and result in a reduction in the grain size. So here on the x-axis, we have normalized grain size and on the y-axis, normalized stress. And there's a relationship between the deformation stress and the grain size such that at high stresses, there's a smaller grain size uh, in many materials. And uh, this has been shown for mantle materials as well. Another type of uh, microstructural modification that's important in the type of research that I, that I do is uh, what's called crystallographic preferred orientation. So that's basically where um, uh, when um, material is strained, so if we imagine uh, a single crystal in tension here with an inclined slip plane, um, if it were pulled in tension with the ends that are not constrained, the deformation platens would uh, translate laterally. Whereas if the ends were constrained, the, uh, the slip planes would have to rotate to accommodate the deformation. And so the idea is in a rock, uh, the neighboring grains are constraining the deformation, causing uh, rotation and alignment of, of grains in the rock, of crystallographic planes in the rock. So here's some uh, data from olivine. So this is uh, up on the left, we have uh, pole figures. So that's uh, uh, showing the orientation of crystallographic directions in an aggregate. So at low strains, you see that the points are somewhat randomly distributed. And as the rock is sheared, in this case, top to right, uh, the A axes align in the shear plane and the B axes align perpendicular to the shear plane. And this leads to anisotropy uh, in the viscosity of the material. Um, and that might be important for understanding dynamics of flow in the mantle. Uh, this formation of CPO also leads to one of the most important um, geophysical observables that is important for connecting the type of research that I do uh, to um, mantle flow in kind of the real global sense. So the idea is if you align all these olivine grains uh, and they're elastically anisotropic, a shear wave that propagates through uh, this medium will split into a fast and a slow wave and the seismic station at the top there will uh, record a, a splitting time and that splitting time can then be used to map flow in the Earth's mantle. So that's how we connect the type of uh, data that I produce in, in my lab with actual flow in the earth. So now I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the type of research that I've been working on now that we have some, some context. So this is uh, initially we need um, starting material to run the type of high pressure, high temperature experiments that I run. Uh, and those, the requirements of that starting material is that we want a fine grained, highly dense, pure olivine aggregate. Um, so uh, some of the work that I've been working on is trying to increase the, uh, the density of our material such that we have really like a pore free material uh, to work with. And so I'm just going to describe uh, the conventional hot pressing method. So the conventional hot pressing method has been used to make olivine aggregates for uh, a large body of experimental research on uh, olivine aggregates. The idea is that you start with gem quality crystals of naturally derived olivine that's pulverized in a fluid energy mill, uh, packed into uh, a metal can and placed in this uh, ceramic column, and then put uh, under gas confining pressure at 1,250 degrees, and then uh, consolidated into uh, a dense ceramic, of like greater than 98% dense, um, but it comes out uh, kind of this milky, uh, milky greenish color. Um, and so uh, it still has some residual porosity in there. And so to try to uh, get rid of that residual porosity, since mantle rocks uh, will not be affected by second phase porosity, uh, we developed what's called the evacuated hot pressing method, which is essentially the idea is that the powder compact is vented through a porous ceramic uh, during compaction, such that you come out with a highly dense ceramic. So this is just a picture showing uh, conventionally hot-pressed uh, San Carlos olivine that's been used in many, many uh, highly cited uh, 
uh, research projects trying to understand flow in the mantle, and then my evacuated hot pressed uh, San Carlos olivine uh, on top of trans. Uh, this is a one millimeter thick slice sitting on top of uh, the alphabet um, on transmitted light, uh, showing that you can easily read through our one millimeter thickness, just kind of giving a, uh, a just macro uh, observable that we've we've really uh, gotten a much denser ceramic by using this process. So to understand grain growth in these materials, because ultimately we want to understand, uh, we want to be able to understand what controls the grain size in the mantle so that we can understand flow in the mantle, uh, we did static annealing experiments on both conventionally hot pressed material and uh, evacuated hot pressed material. So on the left I have a micrograph showing uh, the microstructure of a conventionally hot pressed olivine aggregate. And you can see that it's um, sort of a uniform fine grain material with uh, some small amount of porosity. But when we anneal that at one atmosphere, we see kind of the expansion of all of this trapped porosity. And there's almost no grain growth in this aggregate. So we can't really use this to study grain growth um, in the mantle because uh, the stored porosity is pinning uh, the grain growth. So then uh, repeating the same experiment on uh, an evacuated hot press material, again, we see the microstructure of evacuated hot press that's uh, a fine grain aggregate with almost no porosity. And then when we do the same experiment, we can see, uh, I've flown this in at this scale so that you can actually see a number of grains. And each of these are now grains. So we can see that grain boundary uh, mobility is no longer hindered by porosity anymore. And we get a massive amount of grain growth. So then we did some more systematic studies at pressure to understand uh, static annealing in um, evacuated hot press material. So what we do is we take uh, a cylinder, we do an evacuated hot press, uh, we cut a piece out of it, put it back into the powder, and then perform a conventional hot press around it. And that way we can compare uh, the grain growth in the evacuated hot press directly with the conventional hot press uh, under the same conditions. And so this is just a micrograph from one of those experiments. And you see on the left a coarse grain region, and on the right a fine grain region. And uh, the boundary between them is the boundary between the evacuated hot press embedded in the conventional hot press. And you can see that even at uh, pressure, the evacuated hot press has you know, much more rapid grain growth. And this has implications for uh, dynamics of the Earth mantle. So just comparing this with uh, some previous work on grain growth in peridotites, this is all uh, data from uh, previous uh, studies on, or on conventional hot presses. And so on the x-axis, we have one over temperature. And on the y-axis, grain boundary mobility uh, calculated from, microstructure, from microstructural observations. And this can be broadly divided into three categories. So the slowest um, grain growth is in dry aggregates at low pressures, and uh, then uh, dry aggregates at higher pressures has slightly higher mobility, and then wet aggregates, in this case we're talking about um, OH defects in a nominally anhydrous mineral, has even uh, faster grain boundary mobility. And when we take some uh, oops, parameters taken from our microstructures, we find that um, Evacuated hot press material has boundary mobility um, when at, at low pressures, equivalent or, or similar to uh, the conventional hot presses at high pressure. And our uh, evacuated hot press uh, at high pressure or, or at, at pressure has boundary mobility uh, that is on the order of or exceeds boundary mobility of uh, previously studied wet aggregates um, on, at, at pressure. So we were happy with those materials, and now we were confident that we could study um, microstructural modification in olivine aggregates. And so then we moved on to study, uh, to do actual deformation experiments. So these are high strain experiments looking at microstructural modification of the rock. Uh, so what we do is a high strain torsion experiment. So what we've done is take an evacuated hot press slice, uh, stick it in this column of uh, alumina and zirconia ceramic. This whole thing is then jacketed in a steel jacket. Uh, 
uh, placed in our high resolution gas medium deformation apparatus. So um, this is uh, an apparatus where our sample column is here. It's surrounded by a pressure vessel that allows us to get up to 300 MPa uh, gas confining pressure. Uh, there's an internal, uh, internally heated furnace. Uh, down here we have a load cell that is a, an elastic piece that has strain gauges in it that measures the torque on the sample. And at the top we have our torsion actuator that actually uh, twists this material. So this material is going to be twisted in some cases um, one to two full revolutions, so taking this material to high strain. So here's just a picture from the lab. Uh, that's the seat that I spent way too much time sitting in, uh, in front of this box, and in there is uh, our um, pressure vessel, internally heated pressure vessel deformation apparatus. Uh, then uh, what we wanted to do is to study the, the modification of the microstructure under static conditions after it's been deformed. Uh, so then we take our, uh, our deformed sample, cut it into pieces, and put it back inside the powder and uh, anneal it like we did before and compare uh, microstructural modification. After uh, our experiment, we take the samples out and we do EBSD. So we take a look at um, Kikuchi pattern that tells us the orientation of the crystals. Then we can make a false color map of the crystallographic orientation and look at uh, the distribution of crystallographic axes in the rock. So this is just, this is just a, um, an example of the kind of mechanical data that we get out of our uh, experiments. So on the x-axis, we have shear strain up to uh, shear strains of 10. So that's like a full revolution. Uh, and then shear stress on the y-axis. We do constant twist experiments. We do strain rate stepping experiments. Um, and we can take a look at, uh, we can make sections of the rock and look at uh, false color maps of the crystallographic orientation, uh, look at the, that the grain size has been refined and that there's a strong uh, shape preferred orientation of the grains. We can also look at the uh, evolution of the CPO as we uh, deform the material. And then we've done these uh, annealing experiments where we see that after annealing at pressure, uh, the grains become more equiax, the, the microstructure coarsens, um, and uh, the, the actual distortion within the grains is reduced. And so this is just a plot of uh, annealing of different uh, deformed microstructures. And uh, within that, we can look at uh, what's called the kernel angular misorientation. So that's if you looked at a, a single pixel and then looked at the uh, misorientation of the uh, uh, surrounding pixels, that's like basically looking at a local curvature of the crystals. We can create another false uh, color map of the, what's called the cam and then um, look at the evolution of the cam with uh, static annealing time and see that the internal distortion of grains is reduced as we anneal the rock and um, then we can try to make inferences about how that would occur in the earth. So just uh, an overview is um, evacuated hot pressing reduces porosity to the point that we can easily read through a millimeter thick slice. Uh, grain boundary is mobility is enhanced relative to conventional hot presses of the same material. Um, high strain torsion of uh, this material leads to grain size refinement, intragranular crystallographic distortion and development of strong shape preferred orientation, <coughs> development of strong crystallographic preferred orientation. And uh, when we statically anneal these samples, uh, uh, grains become progressively equiax. Uh, intergranular distortion is reduced and uh, CPO geometry and strength seems to remain relatively constant. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to say uh, thanks to the fellowship, um, thanks to our funding sources and collaborators, and I guess I probably have time for questions. Thanks.